I said, racial equity in the law is um, an initiative of CMBA um, where we want to make a permanent and positive change around diversity and inclusion and around uh, justice reform. And so we are bringing uh, as many of these topics as we can to the forefront. And um, the Asian American community certainly has, has been uh, victimized by COVID in uh, more ways than, than one, for sure. So um, I'm going to pitch it to Deborah Yu. Deborah is the, the new chair of uh, CMBA's Thought Leadership Committee and uh, is leading this forum today. Deborah. Thank you very much, Brennan. And also thank you to the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association for hosting these informative real talks focusing on racial equity in the law. Also thank you to the Asian American Bar Association of Ohio for co-sponsoring today's talk. Uh, now today we'll be discussing how Asian Americans are being targeted during the COVID-19 pandemic. But as you'll hear today, the Asian American community has long experienced these type of hate crimes and incidents, but the pandemic has uh, caused an unfortunate resurgence. Uh, through our distinguished panelists, you'll learn some background context, the difference between hate crime and hate incidents, and the community's response. So I'd like to introduce you to each of our esteemed panelists. Uh, first, we have Bridget Brennan. Bridget, will you wave? Bridget serves as the first, assist first assistant United States attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. She joined the office in 2007 and served in the following positions. District Ethics Advisor, Chief of the Civil Rights Unit, Chief of the Criminal Division. She has prosecuted several significant matters, including the largest credit union failure in U.S. history, an arson in Toledo's largest mosque, and the first religiously motivated hate crime under the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Ms. Brennan was a litigation, prior to joining the United States Attorney's Office, she was a litigation associate with Baker Hostetler. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from John Carroll University and her law degree from Case Western Reserve University. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Elaine Zhao. Elaine, wave, wave. She is the CEO of Asian Services in Action, also known as Asia. In this role, she is responsible for leading the largest health and social services agency in the state of Ohio, focused on empowering Asian Americans and Pacific Islander immigrants and refugees. Asia's mission is to empower and advocate for the AAPIs so that they have access to quality, culturally and linguistically appropriate information, health and social services. Elaine supervises a leadership team responsible for direct health and social services, policy advocacy, capacity building, civic management, uh, civic engagement and special projects. She also has the responsibility of ensuring compliance with the requirements for Asia's International Community Health Center, a federally qualified health center. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce to you Tessa Schwan. Tessa, we wait. Tessa is a community organizer and the statewide chair of OPAL, a grassroots community of Asian, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islander women and non binary people working to build collective power in Ohio and to build solidarity with the Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color. As the founder and principal of WOC Group LLC, Tessa also works as a strategy consultant and facilitator for nonprofits and grassroots organizations. Prior to moving to Cleveland, Tessa lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, where she worked in research and development at Procter & Gamble and later served as the executive director of the Greater Cincinnati Chinese Chamber of Commerce. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Elaine to get us started. Elaine?
Hi, everyone. I am Elaine Sao. I am the CEO at Asian Services in Action, and I'd like to thank the CMBA for, uh, and the Asian American Bar Association for hosting and co-hosting this uh, event today. So I wanted to provide a quick overview of you know exactly who we are, uh, who we are, and, and who we are talking about um, on this topic. So Asian Services in Action is a health and human services organization that serves immigrants and refugees through its community health centers and social services. Um, a particular uh, need that is uh, filled by our services is that um, uh, all of our staff members uh, or the majority of our staff members are bilingual or multilingual so that they're able to provide language access to our clients and patients. Um, a little bit of background about uh, the uh, Asian American Pacific Islander community. It is the fastest growing ethnic group in the United States. Uh, between 2000 and uh, 2010, the population of uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders increased by 46% to an estimated 17.3 uh, million or 5.6% of the total US population. You know, we are awaiting uh, anxiously the, the 2020 census results. Um, and a quick plug, uh, if you have not completed your 2020 census, um, I encourage you to do so. And uh, if you need any assistance, uh, we can help you at Asian Services in Action. Um, Another bit of background, you know, the continent of Asia is very diverse. Um, there are 48 different countries um, that are part of the continent of Asia, and um, each country has its own unique cultures. Um, within the state of Ohio, um, Asia, uh, Asian Services in Action, the organization, uh, serves mostly uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, Hmong, and um, some other different, different ethnic groups from uh, Burma, Myanmar, um, uh, Bhutan, and Nepal. Just a quick overview of the, the history of Asian American Pacific Islander um, immigration in this country. Um, so in 1882, um, there was an act known as the Chinese Exclusion Act which halted all Chinese immigration and, um, you know, into this country. And, and even those who were born in the US uh, could be denied citizenship rights. Um, this was not repealed until the later passage of the uh, Magnuson Act in 1943. So um, nearly a century of uh, exclusion of Chinese immigrants. Uh, Around the same time, in 1942, um, Japanese internment camps uh, were in existence um, just as a response to uh, World War II um, anti-Asian uh, sentiments. And ultimately, um, you know, not a single Japanese American was ever found guilty of uh, esp espionage, despite um, this mass incarceration uh, that included uh, children. Um, Post-1965, the, the Hart Seller Act opened up new waves of immigration and the AAPI community um, in particular uh, was transformed with over 7 million new Asian immigrants arriving uh, between 1971 and 2002. Um, and this is just a, uh, a brief overview of the countries of origin for the Asian American Pacific Islander communities that came to the US. In the 40s and 50s, um, uh, the J Japanese uh, you know, were released from, from the internment, internment camps. Um, and then in the 1960s, the Filipino community arrived uh, in the area. Um, this is in, in, in Ohio as well. Uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, um, you know, post-Vietnam War, uh, as well as uh, Chinese immigrants, um, came to this country. In the 70s and 80s, it was Koreans. In the 80s and 90s, um, Laotian, Cambodian, and uh, 
Hmong refugees came to this country. Um, in, in the 1990s to the present, uh, the Karen community uh, came to Ohio predominantly in 2006. The Burmese community, community came in 1992. Um, refugees from Bhutan in uh, 2008. And um, there were different phases of uh, um, Uzbek, uh, Afghans, and Iraqi uh, refugees that came to this country more recently. Um, you know, just a couple of uh, terms and definitions. Um, so there are refugees, immigrants, internally displaced persons, and asylum seekers, all um, having different rights and statuses uh, in, in the U.S. Um, I'll focus on, on refugees and, and immigrants uh, because that's the population that uh, we're predomin predominantly serving at Asia. Um, the main distinction between refugees and immigrants uh, is the urgency uh, with which um, they are seeking, uh, seeking to, to, to relocate to another country. Refugees are in um, you know, imminent threat of their safety, and so they need to seek refuge on an emergency basis. Um, immigrants uh, go through an application process to enter this country. So um, the top 10 largest uh, US immigrant groups are identified here. Um, as you can see, the, the largest uh, Asian uh, community is Asian Indians, uh, followed uh, quickly by uh, Chinese and Filipinos. Um, and I, I like to share this, uh, this chart because it really shows the dramatic change over time that, uh, you know, since they've been collecting this information, you know, since post-Vietnam post uh, era to the present, um, which is basically my lifetime, uh, the, the amount of refugees that were admitted to this country has dropped from, you know, over 200 thousand uh, down to um, you know less than less than 20,000 and it's uh, you know COVID aside that there is a threat um, that the number of refugees welcomed into this country will uh, plummet to zero um, under the the current uh, administration so it's a kind of a very stark um, stark reality and uh, hopefully uh, we will have some advocacy around um, supporting and welcoming uh, others to this country, um, particularly Im immigrants re and refugees who are, you know, responsible for building and elevating cities. So a little bit about Asia. Um, Asia is primarily in Northeast Ohio, um, serving uh, in Cuyahoga County and Summit County across two um, Two, two sites. Um, we have a community health center in both Cleveland and Akron, and we also have uh, social services offices in Cleveland and Akron. Um, you know, like the national data, um, the Asian Indian uh, population is uh, the largest uh, group of AA, um, you know, Asian Asian American uh, demographic in our in our area, um, followed by um, you know. Chinese and, um, you know, some of the other uh, countries, uh, Nepali, um, Vietnamese, Filipino, Korean. Um, in the state of Ohio, uh, at last, according to this 2017 data, there were over 320,000 AAPIs living in the state of Ohio. Um, and a little bit of background about uh, some of the challenges and stressors for um, Northeast Ohio refugees, um, which I think um, is informative for uh, why uh, these community members, um, you know, are extremely challenged by the current uptick in um, negativity towards the uh, towards these community members. Um, 
you know, uh, refugees typically come from uh, war-torn or other um, social unrest um, existing in their countries of origin. You know, they've had uh, experience with, uh, you know, violence, uh, torture, other horrible and unthinkable uh, situations. So many of these refugees have pre-existing, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder so that, um, you know, the, the current environment is particularly uh, stressful um, for them to experience uh, the uptick in negativity surrounding, um, you know, anti-Asian racism during this uh, COVID period. Um, additionally, uh, many uh, refugees are illiterate even in their uh, own languages, in, in the, the language of their countries of origin. Um, as part of, uh, you know, some ethnic cleansing, sometimes um, community members are not permitted to attend school. And so um, that results in uh, mass illiteracy. Um, and when, when people come to this country, language challenge is, uh, you know, very critical to address. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, aside from those extreme stressors, uh, there's also this kind of overall uh, unfamiliarity with a new environment. You know, there's, there's culture shock, you know, uh, Northeast Ohio winters um, are hard to uh, adapt to for, for those of us that have, uh, you know, spent our lifetimes um, uh, surrounded by, by uh, th those types of winters. Um, imagine if you came from a more tropical env environment and had never seen snow before. Um, those things are uh, challenging for com uh, community members uh, in that space. Um, and also, you know, some community members are, you know, separated from their families. Um, they're not able to uh, communicate their needs or wants in a common language uh, with, um, uh, you know, even helpful people who uh, wish to wish to help these uh, immigrants and refugees, and um, that can create stress as well. Um, then, of course, the uh, the stress of um, wanting to wanting to and needing to support your family through through work, and um, and then uh, for older for older adults that come to this country, um, isolation. You know, maybe their their children are off at work all day long, um, and they don't have the the same um, types of uh, support um, support and and cultural interaction that they might have had in their prior um, environment. So um, that in, con in, 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 uh, in concert with, um, I guess, limited exposure of, of some, some professionals in, in this country to, to the, those cultural uh, challenges, um, you know, just kind of creates uh, a, a difficult environment for um, these new uh, newcomers to this country. So when things when things like the the types of negativity that are happening um, during this time, the the immigrants and refugees are really uh, reluctant to report things, um, you know, because they you know because everything is unfamiliar when you're a newly arrived immigrant or refugee, and some of the uh, community members have had a, a bad experience with um, police or law enforcement in their country of origin. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, refugees come from environments where, um, you know, it was military police and, you know, that there was, uh, you know, a different type of enforcement and a different type of outcome when you interacted with the police. Uh, added on top of that, there's, um, there's limited trust with police in the U.S. for this community because there are, are few or, or no faces that, that resemble theirs, um, which is an, a whole other challenge. Um, another aspect is the fear of retaliation. You know, there are individuals who, who might report, but they are afraid to report because of, um, you know, concern. You know, for example, if there were a, uh, a young person, a, a member, a youth, a youth member of the community who fears retaliation from you know when they go back to school or something like that, um, you know all these things are uh, very challenging for you know newly arrived immigrants and refugees, um, and then the, of course the, the language barrier, 
um, uh, presents an overarching challenge to, to reporting. Um, fortunately, um, at Asian Services in Action, we do have bilingual staff who are available to assist clients um, who wish to file a police report. Um, this, is the, this is the information. We have a, a staff attorney uh, on, uh, available to assist um, a community member uh, through language access um, if they're in need of uh, reporting a crime. And I wanted to share, um, I wanted to share a quick video that, um, that might give some, inf just give some background about what everyone is, is currently facing. Let me just try and I don't know if you could hear. Is the sound on? I don't think uh, I, are you able to turn the volume up, Elaine? Yeah, I'm sorry, maybe, uh, I apologize. Maybe the, uh, the sound is not able to, 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 to broadcast on my other, on my other screen. Um, but, uh, but, but basically, um, you know, there was a, uh, a, a, a video that went viral um, a video that went viral with uh, someone, you know, giving a racist rant. You know, there was a, a, a family that was trying to enjoy a, a socially distanced meal, <laughs> um, and that there was a, another individual who wanted to disrupt um, that peaceful gathering um, by, by by ranting. Um, you know, just kind of anti-Asian. Uh, uh, racist remarks, and I'm sorry. I, I wish I would have been able to to share um, share that video, but um, you know we would have to. Um, it would take us a minute or two to get that video up, so that's up to the group. There, there's a set. There's a setting where you go in under um, audio settings, and it's share computer audio. Okay, well, um, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, but I, I can share I can share the link uh, in in the chat. Uh, once I've uh, concluded my remarks, but um, if uh, anyone would like to connect with uh, Asian services in action. These are all all of our points of connection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. That was really informative. And then thanks for uh, sharing that link through the chat. Uh, next up, we have Bridget Brennan, who will be uh, discussing hate crimes and uh, discussing the difference between hate crimes and hate incidents. Bridget, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to CMBA and the uh, Asian American Bar Association as well. Deborah and Brennan have been a huge help getting this together. And certainly the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice are grateful to be included in this conversation because it is so critically important. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen here with everyone so we can go through because I think it's important to talk um, not just about sort of um, hate crimes necessarily, but also hate incidents and what's the difference in what people should do. So the Department of Justice, which was founded 150 years ago, to actually do uh, justice, that is the, the heart of what, what the department is, is here for, what it stands for, and what it strives to do every day. Uh, one of the core pillars, if not the core pillar at the time that it was created, was to eradicate violence by the KKK. So civil rights enforcement is the heart, frankly, of what we do, and I'm grateful to have had a career here so far, where civil rights enforcement has been right at the forefront of what I come here to do every day. But there is a difference between hate crimes and hate incidents. And so oftentimes we refer to it like that hate crimes versus hate incidents. But to be fair, hate crimes are a subset of hate incidents. So what Elaine was, was showing us on that YouTube clip, the CEO, uh, I think it was a tech CEO, the things that he said to that family, that was a hate incident. It was vile, it was hard to watch. Um, but that did not rise yet to the level of a hate crime. Because the winner for ill, for good, 
Um, but in instances like this, if you be charged with the words that are used, the First Amendment still protects uh, what people say to a point, uh, right? And so when threats become involved, if what he had said rose to the level of what is considered a threat against the person or property, then it may rise to the level of a hate crime. So that's really the difference. When it comes to what people should do, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but a hate crime means that a person is being threatened or has been injured uh, because of race, color, religion, uh, ethnicity, national origin, sometimes gender, sometimes sexual orientation, or gender identification. And so those instances, those should be reported to law enforcement. And I know, and Elaine touched on this, we know at the department that's not always comfortable for people to do, especially in minority populations. So it's hard, I know, sometimes to just say, oh, call the police, because there can be challenges there. There can be limitations, especially language barriers. But it is important for us to be able to fix the problem. We have to first know that the problem. We have to know of the crime before we can address it and really, frankly, bring the perpetrator to justice. Uh, in hate incidents, they don't always rise to the level of notifying law enforcement, but this is why groups like Asia and OPO are so very important. You should feel comfortable, hopefully people feel comfortable talking to the organizations that are there to stand up for them, to be a voice for them, and to support them. Because hate incidents, they inform where hate crimes might occur. They inform where we as a department need to make sure we're doing a sufficient amount of outreach so these organizations know that they can they can communicate to us. And we uh, hey Bridget, this is Brennan from CNBA. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But could you go back and adjust your audio up a little bit? We're still having a little bit of trouble with that. Sure. I can definitely do that. Just a little higher than we had it set before. Okay. Is that better? That's better. It's a little more distorted, but we'll go with that. Okay. I'll try to help as best I can. So let's go to sort of our ability. There we go. Our ability to legislate hate crimes. They stem from two different places in the Constitution. The first is the 13th Amendment, ratified here in 1865. This covers race uh, and national origin and ethnicity. This is a very important part of our Constitution, and it's a very critical foundation for hate crimes offenses. And then also the Commerce Clause, which you can see is a provision that allows uh, Congress to legislate based on the movement of goods in interstate or foreign commerce. So this is the very first civil rights statute that was enacted. And a very, uh, I think, important fact, and I think an unfortunate fact for us in this country is that this was not signed into law until 103 years, almost 103 years, after the 13th Amendment was ratified. So I think that that delay shows that we as a country have a long way to go when it comes to responding and doing things proactively to address civil rights offenses. But with this statute, which was the primary statute for addressing civil rights offenses in this country for many years, covers the use of force or threats of force to injure, intimidate, or interfere with a person because of that person's race, color, religion, or national origin. And the person has to be tied to a certain protected activity. So while it's broad in the sense that it covers force and threats of force, not every civil rights statute does, this one covers both. It is narrow in the sense that it only covers certain enumerated activities. These include as it's listed here, enrolling in or attending public schools or colleges, the benefits or services, programs uh, provided by a state or a subdivision, uh, working, labor and employment, serving on a, on a jury, traveling in or using interstate commerce, and enjoying public accommodation. So there are many things that people do in their day-to-day -day lives that don't necessarily fit into one of these categories. And so this is where section 245 for us from an enforcement standpoint can be limited. The next important statute that I would highlight for you from a civil rights standpoint is damage to religious real property. 
And Deborah mentioned we prosecuted the largest um, arson of a mosque in Toledo a few years ago. And this was the statute that we used to address that crime. So again, it's an intentional act to deface, damage, or destroy. It does include force or the threat of force, which is important. And because of the religious character of the property, or because of the characteristics of those who are associated with the property. This is not as commonly used as a statute, but it is an important tool in our toolbox to address civil rights crimes. This is the most recently enacted federal civil rights statute. This is what's called the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act. It was signed into law by President Obama in 2009. This statute broadens our enforcement authority. It's the first civil rights statute that recognizes sexual orientation and gender identity as a basis for uh, challenging someone's conduct or what they've done. It is narrower in this sense, though. It does not allow us to prosecute threats in this instance. This statute is limited to willfully causing bodily injury or attempting to do so with a dangerous weapon. It is uh, it's used throughout the country. I will tell you there have been several prosecutions based on this statute. They include the transgender community, they include race. Uh, we've done that here in this district as well. Um, but because of the bodily injury requirement or the attempt with a dangerous weapon, this statute can have some limitations in that sense because the threat may not be available to us. So what happens on the street, which is sometimes where people encounter a, a hate code act, um, if it is not tied to one of those protected activities listed out for everyone earlier under 245, and it's limited that way, because this doesn't cover threats, we may not be in a position to, to prosecute that, that case. So we look at these, we, get, we do a very deep dive with our partners at the FBI to see what we can use, what tools we have available to prosecute offenses. But this is, this is the most recent, and this one is the broadest in terms of who is covered by this particular statute. Now, I'll tell you, uh, the fair housing statute, the criminal portion of the fair housing statute is the most commonly used civil rights statute that we that we do. And largely because in the 60s, 70s, and even all the way until today, this statute is the one that addresses uh, cross burnings. So this statute has been used more than any other to address criminal civil rights offenses. Uh, as you'll see from the slide, importantly, it includes force and threats of force to injure, intimidate, or interfere with someone because of uh, race, color, religion, gender, a disability, familial status, or national origin. It does not cover, despite three attempts uh, at the congressional level to include these groups, it does not cover sexual orientation or gender identity just yet. Um, but they also have to be tied to a specific housing right. So this is where the statute can be broad in some ways and then limited in another. So the limitations are the area that covers is selling, renting, purchasing, trying to get financing for, occupying any dwelling. Uh, in negotiations to do so, you know, communications with a realtor or even the landlord, helping others if someone's trying to aid another in getting a house, uh, that can be covered by this statute as well. Or associating, visiting, um, stopping by uh, a dwelling. That kind of conduct that's tied to a housing right, an actual structure, renting, whatever it is, that can be addressed by this statute. There are also, and I should say actually with respect to the housing statute, the criminal component of it's very important, but what's also very important is the civil component. So while law enforcement gets involved to work on the criminal violations, there's a whole team of folks here in our office who work on the civil side of things. And they will they will bring charges, they will bring lawsuits against people who violate civil rights in a civil capacity. So the civil but a Fair Housing Act 
this office has done several cases where they have addressed landlords who are discriminating against people who want to rent because of or not allowing them to rent because of race, color, religion, national origin, and the other areas uh, listed in that statute. So the folks in our civil division are very, very active in that regard. And adding on to what they do, there's also the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which prohibits people from making uh, financing decisions, uh, approving loans or not approving loans based on someone's minority status. Uh, that's a very important component of what, what we do here. And also, I will say, we started a sexual harassment and housing initiative. This is tied to the Fair Housing Act, but there has been throughout the country, and, and here we have brought a lawsuit uh, within the last year for sexual harass ha harassment and housing, where obviously the landlord is saying, if you want to reduce rent because you can't keep up, you want some sort of accommodation if you want, to even be approved to be a renter here, you have to engage in sexual activity with me. And that is that is a problem. And I will tell you what we have found, and I don't think that it will uh, shock my co-panelists, minority victims of this particular type of conduct are very unlikely to report it. And that is a big challenge for us because there's a vulnerability built into maybe not being able to speak the same language, not feeling that they're connected, not trusting law enforcement, and then they're treated this way. And folks can feel that they are left with no recourse and no option. And so it's a particularly devastating time of victimization. So with that, because I know that there's still more we want to cover, but I want to say uh, to sort of Elaine's point and then also a, a shout out to Asia and Opal as well is when something is happening, who should people call? So I think I said it before, but if your physical safety or the safety of another is being threatened, or somebody has hurt you or assaulted you or damaged property, call 911. Look in whoever it is you think will help you make that contact, but it is very, very important that your safety and the safety of others be protected. It's also important to follow up if you're open to it with the FBI. They won't respond in, in real time, right? They're not the 911 folks who show up within three to four minutes, but they are a critical component in this way. One, they can facilitate a federal civil rights prosecution. They will be the ones who investigate that. But as most uh, folks know, they also keep data and they keep a record of hate crimes and hate incidents to the best that they can. The problem being, if people don't report it to them or they don't report it to local law enforcement, that can be one way that the information that they try to report out every year is incomplete. It can also be incomplete if certain local police departments don't share the information they have with the FBI. So while there's an attempt every year to capture uh, hate crimes and hate incidents and to understand the populations that are being targeted. Uh, if folks don't report that information, we are not able as the Department of Justice to capture it and to share it with communities and to, to, to share it with legislators and everybody else who should be looking at it to understand what as a country we need to do to make sure that everybody here is equally protected. But support services, um, Elaine had even mentioned that if somebody wants to report to law enforcement, but there's a language barrier, uh, Asia can help with that. And that is why it's critical to consider looping in support services to, to contact law enforcement and also to get the support and the help that people need after they've been the victim of this kind of crime. The FBI has victim services. We have victim services as well. But I've learned through my experience that the support services that people choose on their own and that help even in their more day-to-day -day activities are probably the most important support services they have if they've been the victim of a hate crime. And then the U.S. Attorney's Office has a hotline. Again, we can't be the responders in real time if something violent is occurring, but we will, certainly with respect to our civil cases, use this as an opportunity 
to learn that there's something we need to investigate. We have an investigator in our office. Uh, he's fantastic and he works very closely. Clearly, I'm not moving enough. He works very closely with the people in our civil division who specialize in civil rights enforcement on the civil civil side of things. So it's, it's a very useful hotline number for us to know that somebody is being discriminated against. And like I said, when we know that, we can investigate it and we can bring charges to try to fix the problem. So that's, that's really the capture from the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice. I know there's an opportunity for questions as we go forward. So I welcome, I welcome those. So thank you very much and Deborah, to you. Thank you very much, Bridget. That was really informative. And uh, thanks also for, for reminding the audience that if you have questions, please pose them on the, on the chat box and we are monitoring them and we'll, uh, we'll be taking questions uh, at the end of the presentation. And so now to turn over the presentation to Tessa to talk about racial justice and AAPI community safety. Tessa. Tessa, we can't hear you. Uh, Brennan, are you able to unmute? All right. Oh. Is that better? Yep, it is. Yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Um, thank you so much. So I uh, am going to talk about racial justice and AAPI community safety um, in a way that's thinking a little bit beyond law enforcement. So I'm, I'm the only person on the panel who's not a lawyer. Um, so that's the perspective that I'm going to bring. Um, I also am going to bring, you know, some of the the knowledge and experience I've gained from working with OPAL. Um, as Debbie mentioned, I'm the chair of OPAL and we are a statewide um, grassroots organization that's uh, membership based. So we have three chapters in Ohio, um, in Cincinnati, Columbus and Cleveland. And our community is very multi-generational, multi-ethnic, um, representing people coming with different migration histories, um, different migration patterns. And it's um, diaspora communities that are very diverse, um, similar to Asia. So we have people from South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, East Asia, as well as the Pacific Islands and West Asia, otherwise known as uh, the Middle East. So um, I just want to start with a little bit of uh, introduction around how I got into organizing work. Um, this was um, Emily Olson, who uh, was a 13-year-old girl in Southwest Ohio, who um, unfortunately died by suicide in 2014 um, after experiencing long periods of bullying um, that was related to her race. So um, at the time, you know, I was living in Cincinnati, I felt very connected to Emily's story uh, because of the bullying she had experienced, the isolation that I knew that she had experienced, um, especially being adopted from China and, and having white parents. Um, and also, you know, she, she had the same birthday as me. So she was born uh, exactly 10 years after I was born. And after her death, um, it was one of my first organizing experiences. Um, the community really rallied around the family and that you'll see a picture of um, a packed school board meeting at the Fairfield City Schools where um, people from very diverse backgrounds you know, came together to support the family, to put pressure on the school board, which um, you know, had not been following their anti-bullying policies. And there's a photo of me in the corner um, delivering a, a petition full of signatures to the school board. Um, and I just remember that being you know, a really impactful time for, for myself as well as the community um, coming together, you know, getting media attention around this issue. Um, so Emily is someone that 
um, I, I definitely carry her memory with me as I do my, as I do my organizing work. Um, and it's just an example of how, you know, this problem of anti-Asian racism has existed for a long time. Um, and it, it's existed here in Ohio. This was back in 2014, and there's many other examples. Um, but that's just one, uh, one individual I wanted to draw attention to. Um, this is an, art, an article from the 1980s um, following the, the death of Vincent Chin, who um, was um, some, you know, more and more Asian Americans are, are learning about the story of Vincent Chin. Um, he was a Chinese American man who was killed in Detroit um, in 1982 by two laid off auto workers who thought he was Japanese and they had blamed him for um, losing their jobs. Um, so not a lot of people know that the, the final trial for the civil rights case um, around his death took place in Cincinnati. And a Cincinnati jury voted to um, acquit the attacker of all charges. So, you know, this really monumental um, moment in Asian American history um, had a real Ohio connection and it sparked this national movement uh, for, you know, Asian American civil rights organizing. Um, this is just a, a bunch of headlines that <laughs> We found at Opal um, from a lot of them are from you know local Ohio um, news headlines. So just another example of how um, anti-Asian racism and xenophobia is rampant even here in Ohio, even though it may be less visible um, than the headlines we're seeing coming out of other places. So I want to talk briefly about our. Um, reliance on law enforcement, you know, historically as well as today, um, talk about some of the benefits or perceived benefits of, you know, reporting crimes to the police um, as a response to these incidents that are happening. Um, but also, you know, really wanting to talk about this in the context of the movement for Black Lives that is happening. Um, so looking at some of the risks that we know are involved, um, as well as the limitations, um, you know, as, as Bridget was mentioning like the law the law um, has certain protections in place but it's it's it has its own limitations it's not necessarily um always keeping up with you know societal thinking and um there's there's alternatives that we can look at um, regardless of you know people's um decision to to contact the police so um just some benefits of uh reporting crimes to law enforcement um, that I am aware of, you know, there, there's obviously, you know, a need for data, um, having an official record of, of incidents that are happening. Um, if you have uh, property damage or theft happening, you know, it can be a way to restore property to the victim. Um, it could prevent a future crime from occurring, um, or at least temporarily, um, you know, prevent a person from, from committing a crime. Um, it may, you know, provide a victim with a sense of relief or justice, um, potentially. That's definitely one thing that I hear a lot. Um, and also, you know, the, the, the need for officials, public officials, elected officials to have data that they need to be able to make policy changes. Um, so I'm sure there's other benefits that people can, can think of when it comes to reporting crimes to the police. Um, but I think especially in this moment um, where there's a national conversation happening around police brutality, we need to look at the benefits with a grain of salt, um, understanding you know, the complexity of, of the moment, um, and also looking at you know, all of the barriers that were mentioned previously that make it um, hard for especially immigrant communities to report crimes. Um, so what are the alternatives? Um, or what are the additional um, actions that people can take to really feel safe and feel empowered? Um, I guess before I move on to some of the risks that um, are important for us to, to talk about, um, I do wanna mention if you are reporting crimes, um, if possible to, uh, you know, if it's safe to do so, to, to make the report either online 
or you know, to go directly to the police station um, rather than calling 911. And in the context of racial justice, um, in a place you know, here like Cleveland, where we have um, this historic Asia Town neighborhood, um, Asia Town is a very diverse community with you know, significant numbers of Asian Americans as well as Black and Latinx um, residents living there. So calling 911 um, brings, you know, armed police more uh, in close contact with the people who are, are living around you. Um, so one recommendation I would have would just be if it's if it's possible to do so to go to the police station when you're ma making your report. Um, that way you're going to them; they're not coming um, into your neighborhood. And I. I just wanted to include this screenshot that someone shared with me this week as I was working on my, my slides. Um, this is a current, uh, this is on the city of Cleveland online reporting, uh, crime reporting system um, right now. So when you are reporting that you had a theft um, and you're trying to, to document it online, here are the options for um, the type of if, if it was motivated by, by hate or bias, here are the options that you can pick from. And I was very, I was in disbelief <laughs> when I saw that um, they, they say anti-Oriental as one of the options, um, you know, in, in 2020, uh, which is a very outdated term. So um, I, just, I just wanted to include this because, um, you know, as Bridget mentioned, like sometimes the legal system and law enforcement had a lot of catching up to do. So the fact that this is on their website is indicative of maybe some um, other hidden, you know, internal problems when it comes to how our local police department understands race and ethnicity and, and issues of race. But um, again, if it's it's still <laughs> an option, but unfortunately, if you're if you're going to report online um, in Cleveland, um, this is what you will see. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the risks now um, and, you know, some additional reasons um, why people might feel unsafe um, contacting the police um, for the victim and, and for, you know, the person who's committing the crime. Um, so undocumented communities, you know, are also part of the API community. Um, and sometimes when we talk about, you know, even witnessing uh, someone else being harassed, um, the immediate instinct is to call the police. Well, sometimes, you know, if the victim is an undocumented person, calling the police uh, may actually make them feel less safe. So I think it's always important to, if possible, get the permission of the victim uh, before you decide to, um, to bring the police into the situation. Um, also, you know, thinking about different uh, types of situations um, we know that when the police are called on black people, on homeless people, on uh, people with disabilities or mental illness, that there's more likely, um, those, those individuals are more likely to uh, face violence or actually die from, from the police being there. Um, so especially in the, the context of a school setting, right, um, if we think about only looking at the police as the solution to a hate based incident that might occur, um, you're increasing the chance that a student uh, could, could die um, if, if that's the only option that you're looking at. Um, I'm not, and as you know, I, I think that there's a lot of parallels between what's going on right now and um, actually the Me Too movement. So um, as a survivor of sexual violence myself, you know, I fully respect um, and understand, you know, any victim of a violent crime or a victim of a hate crime um, needing to report a crime to the police. Um, I, under I, I understand and respect that. Um, but I also know that it can be a frustrating and disappointing process. Um, and the, the benefits that come from, you know, reporting that crime to the police don't always meet all of the needs that victims have, right, around really feeling safe, feeling supported, um, having a sense of healing and justice. So um, if we look at reliance on law enforcement as the sole way to respond, um, I just feel like it's an incomplete 
uh, solution without also looking at um, you know, how there needs to be a lot of changes made to the criminal justice system. Um, and thinking about what real safety, what real healing and what real racial justice looks like for AAPI communities, um, as well as all communities that are oppressed um, under white supremacy. So this photo is um, just from, it's from the North Royalton Police Station. Um, I wanted to mention that there was a, an incident a few years ago where a Chinese, uh, a Chinese man named Jun Wang um, was having a mental, uh, mental illness um, episode and his sister called the police to help bring him to the hospital so he could get treatment. Um, and what happened was the police escalated the situation, um, cornered him in his bedroom, and he ended up being shot and killed. Um, so I just bring this up as a way to, again, look at some of the risks. Um, clearly, there's you know different levels of different situations that um, where it, you know it's it's never one size fits all. But if there's someone, either the victim or um, the perpetrator, who is mentally ill. Um, who, and the police come in and are involved. This is you know, something that we need to, to think about as, um, yeah, just something that could potentially happen. And I'm sure that you know, the, the sister who called, called the police in this situation was just looking out for her brother and wanted the best for him. Um, but unfortunately, you know, he passed away. So that case is ongoing. Um, a couple of other risks I wanna bring up just around, you know, especially when it comes to the FBI, um, again, I understand calls for uh, reporting to the FBI calls. I've even heard calls for the FBI to create new task forces that, um, you know, specifically deal with anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, but I also know that, th right, the FBI is complicated. The FBI um, has a history of targeting South Asian and Arab American communities, um, you know, doing surveillance in those communities. Um, and un unfairly treating um, Muslim communities. And right now, it's even more complicated where, you know, the Chinese, um, the anti-Chinese sentiment uh, also exists in the FBI. So there's, you know, number of cases of Chinese American scientists being accused of um, espionage. And another, you know, example from Ohio is a woman named Sherry Chen who um, worked for the National Weather Service and was arrested by the FBI for um, potentially being a spy with, with really no, no grounds for her arrest. So she, she lost her job. Um, she was, her, the charges were dropped, but uh, she never got her job back. And so for, some, you know, for someone who's intimately involved in um, Sherry Chen's community um, to, to look at the FBI with an uncritical eye, um, I think would be a mistake. Um, and lastly, I would just say, um, looking at this conversation, again, without nuance, um, with only a reliance on police, um, just helps to create more cycles of distrust with other communities of color, um, as there's a national conversation happening for us to ignore the fact that um, police violence is a real threat to some communities um, can help to, can, can hurt the, the ability for our communities to, to build solidarity with each other. Um, and also doesn't acknowledge the fact that the majority of Asian immigrants who were able to come to the US um, after 1965 were able to do so because of the leadership and sacrifices of uh, black organizers in the civil rights movement. So I know I don't have um, a lot of time left, where, so I want to wrap up quick um, in a few more minutes. Um, I just want to emphasize you know, that many organizations, especially those led by, by Black and Brown people, are thinking um, more creatively and envisioning really what a safe, healthy, healthy community looks like. Um, so uh, there's you know, this understanding that safety is really honestly achieved when you know your neighbors when you feel a strong connection to the neighborhood you live in, um, when you're in a network of mutual support and accountability. And um, furthermore, like when communities really feel like collectively that they have some power over 
the future of their lives, um, over the direction that their neighborhood is going, um, over the policies that are, you know, happening to them. Um, and, you know, the changes that we want to make to address anti-Asian racism, we want to make those changes in a way that also um, creates a safer society for other, other marginalized communities. So um, some alternatives um, that people can also consider because there's a range of different responses that people can choose from um, when responding to uh, hateful incidents. Um, there are national reporting sites that are not affiliated with law enforcement. Um, so standagainsthatred.org and the Stop AAPI Hate Tracker are two um, national uh, sites that are connected to Asian American advocacy groups. Um, you can also share your story with local trusted community organizations. So I know Asia has really trust, uh, a lot of trust built with their clients. Um, they've heard, you know, really powerful stories of, of incidents that have happened here in Ohio. Um, so even if that they're, they're not able to convince um, those clients to, to contact the police, those stories are extremely powerful. Um, and those can be used in advocacy meetings with our, with our lawmakers. Um, and actually, in my experience, lawmakers respond uh, a lot more to personal stories rather than data. Um, so if there are details around, you know, actual incidents that have happened here, um, if there's news reports, if there's even a first person um, narrative, those are extremely powerful and those make a big impact. Um, and mm -hmm. I put, you know, uh, an email address here um, that because Opal has been collecting stories from around the state, um, we know that there are members in Ohio who have been spit on, who have been called um, racial slurs, you know, who have had a number of different types of things happen to them. So we're, we're keeping track of all of the different stories we've heard from around the state. Oh, Tessa, thank you. Um, and much. last, I would say connect, uh, connect to your elected officials. And that's a very broad <laughs> um, suggestion. And I know it's, it can be hard to navigate. Um, but again, you know, Asia is, is working on advocacy to local um, elected officials. OPAL has, um, you know, I've seen our members talk to legislators um, at their offices for the first time. And I, I've seen the powerful change that it's made in each of them, you know, speaking about their stories um, to someone in a position of power for the first time. And that's a, that's look at how change has happened historically. Um, again, it's, it's not because data <laughs> Uh, and logic drives lawmakers to, to make policy changes. It's really when there's really a, a lot of public support and active public support for an issue. When lawmakers are getting phone calls from their constituents, um, when they're hearing questions about these things in town halls, when they're seeing petitions with lots of signatures on them, that's when lawmakers um, are really compelled to make change and make change in a way that's reflecting what the community wants. Well, I see that. So, um, I'm going to drop a a, a link into the chat um, for a petition that you can sign from the ACLU. And uh, this is just one example. Um, they actually modeled this off of a letter that um, Opal had sent earlier in the year that um, received you know, over a thousand signatures um, in just a few days, uh, which and that already you know, caused different law lawmakers to um, put out public statements about anti-Asian racism that they, uh, we hadn't been hearing from them before. Um, Tessa, uh, Tessa, I, I know. That I, won't, I won't go into in detail, but um, someone who we found from the, our sign-on letter um, shared this story with me about her first experience attending a virtual school board meeting. Um, oh, and Tessa? And daughters who were in second Tessa? grade had, had experienced a, a hate incident and she, uh, she, That's she right. can you hear us in her voice at the school board meeting? And that experience has changed her. Um, and you know, it's something that where she could speak directly to the people who had the power to, to, um, Tessa, can you hear us? Tessa? Okay, I thought caught her at the oh. end of the sentence. Okay, uh, Tessa, thank you, uh, very much. And uh, I want to, I see that we are over our time, it's 106. Um, I know that we didn't get to all the questions. 
And so please go ahead and add, uh, and Tess, I know that you had some resources at the end of your uh, presentation, if you can put them in, I, I invite all of the speakers to invite any, uh, you to add some, uh, any links to resources to the chat box, and then we can, uh, we can make sure that we get it out to all attendees. We, we will follow up with uh, a link to all attendees. Um, so yes, you can expect that. Great, thank you very much. And if there are questions that, um, that are asked, Brenda, if you could pass them along, we'll do our best to respond to them. Yes. But, um, yeah. but thank you all very much for joining us and for taking the time uh, to join us in this important discussion. I want to thank our distinguished speakers for providing so much useful information and practical tips in addressing this issue. I hope that this begins the conversation within the community in terms of uh, the importance of uh, reporting and addressing these particular incidents during uh, COVID-19. Again, thank you to the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, to the Asian American Bar Association of Ohio for bringing this real talk to us. And um, Brendan, I think that uh, you can maybe let them know I, I see that there's some uh, some interesting real talks scheduled uh, for the next few weeks. Yeah, just very quickly, the next two, um, Cracking the Old Boys Network is Thursday, July 30th at noon. And then we have something called The Role of Civil Unrest in Fomenting Change. Uh, that is Friday, August 7th. Both of these are uh, hosted and created and uh, by our diversity and inclusion committee. So we ask you to register and join. You can find that information on our website, cleemetrobar.org, or on any of our social media sites. So um, with that, unless there's anything else, I, I'm gonna say goodbye. Sounds good. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day, but thank you very much for uh, spending your lunchtime with us. Thank you. <laughs>